All right, everybody, I'm Matt Cook, Emerging Technologies Coordinator, OU Libraries. That is my counterpart, Zach Lisher Cassie, who will be talking shortly. I'm going to kind of lay out the agenda and sort of uh, where we are in terms of virtual reality applications for pedagogy and research on campus. I think here it is, here's the agenda. So <laughs> this is going to be our talk in a nutshell. I'm going to start out by contextualizing the project, kind of telling you all where we are right now today as of April 2017. Zach's going to jump in for preservation challenges and research initiatives, and then we're going to end on kind of a back and forth, a cross talk, if you will, on <laughs> takeaways. Next slide. Right, so here's some stats just to dive right into it. Um, kind of a state of the union for OU libraries, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, OU libraries is OU full stop in terms of virtual reality. We started looking at this technology a couple years ago, so we're pretty well developed in a couple research programs and several course integrations. The hardware element, which we have deployed right now, is primarily Oculus based. Those are Rift uh, consumer version one headsets, eight at three campus locations that are networked. We actually have three HTC Vive workstations and a ton of cardboards laying around. The important takeaway from the hardware portion of the slide is that all of these are publicly accessible, which means we're seeing uses and adoptions and student clubs, for example, that are emerging from this that we didn't predict, which is great. It's wonderful. It's organic growth that we wanted. Um, and then in terms of sessions, because we do get data gathering at each of the sites where these workstations are deployed, we've had a thousand plus, not necessarily unique users, but people sit down in a chair and engage with a piece of educational software. And this is as of the beginning of the year. So you're looking at essentially stats from last year up until the early part of this year. Uh, course touchdowns refers to full class periods that, that took place in one of the three, and this is one in the main library here, of our VR workstation locations. Um, we also kind of try to onboard people with the project and what we've done with these intro to VR workshops. You can kind of consider what I'm doing now, kind of the beginning of an intro to VR workshop that we'll give on a weekly basis for the general public, for staff, for faculty. You can walk in off the street and importantly, even if you're not a technical person by training, which I'm not, you can get the background to get started and we'll give you the basics of how to interact with the system, what software we have, where we're going. And then, of course, the big win, as far as I'm concerned, is these kind of in-depth course integrations, which I'll talk about now. Uh, slide, please. Ah, here we go. So these are kind of the more in-depth, well-developed projects that we've done in the course of, I would say, the last year, because prior to that, we were just kind of getting our footing. Um, architecture is the big, the big partner here. Um, particularly interior design, which would be a way for undergrads prior to being 30 years old, 35 years old and constructing their first architectural design in real life. Uh, they can be 18 and 19 years old and inhabit or cohabit with their faculty, with their student groups, a building of their own design. And this is important because what you'll hear from faculty time and time again is students only see the floor plan of their buildings when they're sketching and doing blueprint work and Revit and stuff like this. So they can walk through, this is an example of one session like that, although that's not the architecture class. These are shared network workstations, which I'll talk about in a minute. And as of two weeks ago, we finished data gathering for a study that's um, ongoing with the architecture college. So they're integrating this regularly on a semester by semester basis with the regular coursework. The medical imaging example, which is actually what we're looking at here, they're walking through uh, carcinoma, lung carcinoma actually in VR. So what we're kind of trying to represent with this part of the slide is the workflows that we're kind of pioneering, uh, at least in terms of course integration. So we're taking DICOM data, which could be MRI, CT, CAT scan data, transferring that volumetric data into a surface mesh for deployment in VR. And then we have advanced medical imaging grad level courses coming in. And you know, scale is instantly manipulable in this landscape. Um, there's no such thing as like a limited perspective. You can fly inside around and look at from any angle um, this you know, actual medical data. I'll go on to anthropology next. Right now, this week, there's a required assignment for anthropology 1114. They're going to the library or to the research campus where we have these workstations and they're comparing hominid fossil skulls, which are taken from a series of different databases in virtual reality. They're exporting perspectives from screenshots that are taken within a sagittal crest of a Neanderthal. And then they're emailing that back to their professor to prove that they can locate this part of the uh, pre-hominid anatomy. And then just in terms of a research uh, application that had both input and output mechanisms, structural biology, visualizing protein, spe specifically from the protein data bank, 
students in advance of this class would uh, email or upload to a Dropbox a .pdb file, which is a, an interesting file format. We can get into it in the reception, but we have workflows, once again, like with medical imaging, to convert that into something that you can view in virtual reality. And then they were exporting narrated video or presentation with their classmates. Um, slide. And then this is kind of the even more context, a little bit deeper dive. So two years ago, I went to UAL, UALR, University of uh, Arkansas, Little Rock, and I saw they had a cave system. That was impressive. I also saw they had an Oculus DK2, which was the second developer kit. We took something like that to our campus. We started showing faculty what was possible, and we had a problem, which was every single faculty we showed this to wanted their own virtual reality application. So we, <laughs> we essentially developed and deployed our own custom virtual reality workstations that allow you to remotely upload your own 3D content through the library website directly to virtual reality, and then you walk in the door and your content is waiting for you. That's what you're seeing here, the hardware aspect of it. So it's a custom designed sliding rail chair assembly with the PC built below and behind the user for uh, cable management and range of motion purposes. And then the software, like I mentioned, allows for remote upload of an arbitrary uh, amount of data, 3D data. So that's kind of our contribution. These stations, once again, are located all over campus. They're publicly accessible, and they're now replete with data from uh, a whole bunch of different classes. Zach's going to take over. All right, thank you very much, Matt. As you can see, we have a lot of great uh, work going on in VR. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the data curation concerns that start to come up with that around reproducibility, transparency, integrity, and security. And first, I'll just say I'm, uh, I'm Zach Lesher-Katz. I'm a clear fellow at OU, basically working on uh, dealing with all these great new technologies that Matt is bringing in and thinking through all the content, uh, curation issues. And I'm going to talk about um, two parts of this. Uh, first, the, the VR platform itself, software and hardware and all that, and then also the VR content. Um, and you'll see as, w as we're starting to bring more researchers into using this technology, these curation concerns are becoming increasingly dire. So. Uh, for the platform, uh, we really have you know, things that we've been dealing with for a while, hardware software obsolescence, which poses risks to continued access to this uh, material. Uh, also, um, as we move forward, maintaining access to material that, uh, that we've archived. Uh, there's issues of uh, versioning, so as, we, as um, Matt's team develops new software or revises the software, we want to make sure that we're keeping track of that so that if a, a scholar comes in and brings in, um, uh, visualizes some da uh, data in our, in our software, they can, they can go back to the version that they used and document that. So issues of repro reproducibility are really important to document there. Um, so like, uh, we're looking at all these various preservation approaches. So uh, thinking about documenting all the changes as we adopt, you know, update drivers or bring in new uh, pieces of, uh, we just adopted what's the uh, Oculus Touch. Right. So these new controllers, we need to document that. Uh, thinking about emulation strategies. Uh, we're monitoring standardization initiatives. Uh, for instance, the Kronos Group uh, has this open XR initiative. They're calling it XR for a, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and everything else. And they're developing standards for VR headset. Or, so that VR headsets can communicate with software in a, in a standardized way. Um, we're looking at recording the experience of VR, you know, so in 10 years, we're like, what was it like to actually use VR in 2017? So recording users or maybe even doing oral histories, things like that. There's the old computer museum approach where we just we save all the hardware and try to keep it running for as long as possible. Um, this poses an interesting problem. Um, I'm actually working with a grad student at NYU who's doing the history of the, of the sort of 1990s VR wave, and she found that, um, in her experience, she hasn't found a lot of uh, software that survived. Um, for instance, at the Living Computers Museum in Seattle, they have 23 VR headsets, 51 pieces of related hardware, but they don't have any software packages or the uh, computers to run it on. Um, slide. Uh, so directions forward, uh, thinking about, since um, Matt didn't go into too much detail about this, but basically all that software that we're using to, to um, visualize 3D models was developed by his team in-house. So we have all the source code. We have all, the, we're keeping track of all, all that in our GitHub account. Um, so we can track that, we can document that, we can encourage scholars to start citing that, that um, our software releases. And I've been looking at um, using uh, Zenodo, which is a, a great platform for archiving research data, uh, as, as 
it, it, it has this great function that will just watch your GitHub um, repository. Every time you do a release, it'll actually take that, archive it, and, and issue a DOI, which is really nice. So um, on, the t on the tech side, having some sort of automated process for that, but then getting scholars to actually cite the software they're using when they um, publish their research. Just like, um, VR content, it's a huge universe. Uh, 3D models, this is basically what we're dealing with most of the time in our uh, platform. Um, there's point cloud data, mesh data, volumetric data. We're even getting starting at 360 videos, which we haven't really talked about, but it's uh, the journalism department, for instance, is really excited about that. And that can include um, sort of just flat videos that are 360 or also binocular sort of uh, 3D videos. Um, I talked about software a little bit. Uh, a lot of, we're actually using other software that's produced by uh, third parties um, that are bought through the Oculus Store. So there's a lot of interesting issues that are around archiving those things, which they're protected by DRM and things like that. So that's a whole other project. Uh, and thinking of, uh, about archiving the source code, I talked about that slide. Um, other things we're thinking about in terms of VR content, uh, sustainable file formats. Uh, uh, we've done a little research on that. Metadata is a huge issue, and all the derivative data that can be produced, uh, and tying this all together to some data repositories that can help us think through, um, that can help us preserve and manage all this content. This uh, so we've been playing around with the file format, uh, Colada or Colada, I don't know how people like it. I always think of coffee and culotta, but um, <laughs> it was developed by the Kronos Group, and it's, uh, it was designed for interchange between software, uh, 3D models and software packages. Uh, it's XML-based, it's open. If you open it up, you can, you can put in all this um, metadata, actually, into these nodes here, or you can add your own custom nodes. The most, well, the most pressing thing for us when we're uh, modeling 3D models and, and having researchers work with them was scale data. So if you're bringing in a 3D model of a skull, you want to be able to have uh, information about the scale of it, and so it's an accurate size representation when you bring in, and you can do actual measurements in VR. Um, so we actually are able to put in the unit measure. This is, I believe, millimeters, and then you can actually orient it. You can tell how the model should be represented in that space. So that's really really helpful, um, and uh, and it it's 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 been good so far. We haven't had any problems. So mm -hmm. interesting to hear some feedback on that slide. Yeah. Uh, we're look, there's a, obviously a variety of ways in which you can make 3D content. Right now, I'm looking at photogrammetry workflows. Uh, we have some researchers who are scanning things, and I'm observing them and asking them, okay, what are you doing here? What's the metadata? And then I'm looking at the software they're using to see what kind of technical metadata we can pull out. Um, and the big concerns here are being able to document at each stage uh, the decisions that are being made and how you're processing of the, uh, the models and editing them so that a researcher who's getting the 3D model down the, the road can trust the precision and accuracy of that model. And so this is sort of the big map. This is the big high level map that we're working on here. <coughs> um, the data repository that we're trying to put together here has to fit into this larger 3D ecosystem that I've been describing for you. Um, the metadata needs to be tracked throughout this. On one side we have, on the far left, we have the data collection, content creation, that's sort of the any sort of photogrammetry workflow or, or laser um, uh, workflow. Um, we need to collect metadata through that and bring that in. Uh, we're basically, that all goes right into Dropbox. We're using some cloud-based solutions. And the, the, the benefit of that allows our entire team to have access to those files instantly, synchronize our files across all our platforms. Um, and that's actually pretty critical. We have actually, and Matt's going to talk a little bit about our, our offsite partners at other places. This allows us to sync our content with them too uh, and bring it into our VR visualization analysis platform. Uh, where in which case, and this is something we're still figuring out, is that in VR we can actually create annotations and um, uh, measurements. And so we need to figure out ways in which we can manage that as a form of uh, content creation and archiving. So the metadata schemas we're developing are trying to take into account all this, things that could be derived from that, like annotations, and, and keep that along the whole um, uh, research life cycle. Also from the Dropbox data repository side, you can uh, go from publishing or actually uh, convert them to STLs and do uh, 3D, 3D printing. Um, the part we're working on now is the data catalog, which will allow us to take these files from Dropbox, which is um, not necessarily archival, uh, and 
bring them into our archive, which right now is uh, Amazon uh, Web Services S3 bucket that we're managing this data catalog. Uh, and it allows us the flexibility to, when we develop our, our, our uh, institutional repository data catalog, we can bring everything in very easily. Um, and this, I mean, that's sort of the long, more medium term solution. Short term, we can curate what gets archived and what doesn't. We're still developing those policies and guidelines. So, for instance, if, a stu you know, if the students bring in 3D models for their class, we may not want to archive those for the future. That may be just you know, one, time, one semester, and they, then we take them off the VR system. Um, but then if you have a researcher coming in modeling things, then we may want to keep those things. So setting up those policies and having, <coughs> a, you know, there has to be someone curating that. Um, and so this is sort of the map, and we're still working out many of these elements. Um, so, select. So, current projects, data repository, I just explained to you, tracking metadata through all that, developing best practices, and figuring out other ways in which we're going to access these things and make, make them available. Um, Matt, do you want to talk a little bit about sure. partnerships? Sure. We don't have any. Yeah, I, I'm a less form grant application is still very early, early stage here, but the, the point is that we have partners at these various institutions, strong partners at Arizona. Uh, in fact, Arizona has deployed a workstation of our design, at least the software design, which is really interesting because we support live voice chat as well as remote upload. So that means right now today we could have a faculty member at Arizona and they have their own specialties and specialized data sets um, guide a class or lecture for eight students simultaneously on the OU campus in virtual reality. So it's basically a VR classroom in the making. Uh, it's technically feasible today. There's a, a couple things that are happening essentially as I'm speaking they're going to make this more and more scalable which is interesting but there are uh, the infrastructure is in place the hardware and software is in place and the, if people in this room are interested the code is available so if you have access to oculus hardware and we're working on a vibe port to this or working on a mobile port to this you can deploy um, this software on your campus gain access to everything our students and faculty have uploaded and then add to that collection to the point where it becomes this giant cloud-based 3D asset repository, which is um, something we're going to archive as well. And then this is kind of getting towards the end. This is very, very current thinking. Um, two things have happened in the very recent past. Number one, I got a really nice new work computer. Thank you, Carl. It's an Alienware machine. It's portable. It has a 10 series NVIDIA GPU. It's super powerful. But the point is, you can now be in virtual reality for longer than five minutes with this processing power. You can this is going to be a productivity tool in the very near future. And what I mean is we're not just going to be viewing models five minutes at a time and taking a screenshot. We're going to be taking measurements, and that functionality is already in place in our platform. You can shoot a laser out of your hand at one part of a skull, shoot the other laser out of your other hand, and it'll take a arbitrarily uh, ac uh, detailed, accurate measurement of the, of the space in between. So you can do science in the system. You can also annotate the models in real time and export those annotations. So you can, it's content creation and then productivity within the software and because the latency is so low with this 10 series NVIDIA GPUs, you can do it for as long as a class period lasts, which is very exciting because up until very recently, um, you have this like spectrum of users and at the low end, they're running to the bathroom after three minutes because they can't handle it. At the high end, you have a couple people that can do it all day, mostly young people, like eight-year-old people. And then in the middle, <laughs> you have the rest of us, right? But it's getting more and more to be a flatter curve, which is great, it's excellent. That's why we're kind of in a, we're well positioned right now and Zach will continue with this. Yeah, and so a couple of the other takeaways, I think, from our initial stages of this research and. Um, is the thinking about what the library's role, a library's role, any library's role in supporting VR sh could or should be. Um, and I think we've, we've brought these issues with infrastructure and technology. There's obviously a buy-in that is necessary. Cost is coming way down. So, you know, the cost of the actual hardware and, and software. Um, data storage, I think, is going to be where your cost is going to be if you want to support something like this for scholarly use. Um, Curatorial, you also need some data uh, experts, some data curators out there to make those policies and sort of create workflows so that we can track the metadata through this construction, uh, through production, through annotation. Um, and then also uh, thinking, going back to the research integrity questions, um, a lot of these become domain specific needs. So archaeology has certain needs, um, architecture has certain needs. 
Uh, how do we track metadata in those contexts? Uh, I think we can, the partnerships we're forming are really important. Uh, platform sharing, that's kind of what Matt was getting at the end where we're able to create this tool, we make it available. Uh, we had a tour going through the other day and someone from the business school is like, oh yeah, this, this is the software they use and they sell it to people. I'm like, we don't sell this software, we make it available to freely to everyone. You know, the more people we have using it, you know, we benefit from that as well. So that has been really great. And then developing standards that we can, for basically all this metadata that gets created through the process um, is, is, I think, a real need that we have. Uh, and then going back to the first point, it's, you know, we're not, it's not just, we're not just playing around here anymore. We're really using this stuff for scholarship. Yeah, I'd so. like to comment on that just further. I was at ALA in, uh, it so in November, I forget, it was the LIDA, sorry, LIDA, it was in Fort Worth not too long ago. And libraries are still very much in this like wow phase, novelty phase with virtual reality. Um, we're not much further past that, but like I said, the technology, the hardware and the software is gonna support much more broad application and deep application. I think it's important to not just be um, satisfied with putting a headset on the first time user and having the oohs and the ahs, which is great. It feels really good, right? But that's a lot of times that's like third party gaming software. We can do a lot more with our own software. We can do a lot more with network software and built in functionality that includes productivity and content creation. We've, we've not yet scratched the surface. The wow factor is gonna get them in the door, but you start working with faculty one-on-one -on -one and students one-on-one, -on -one, grad students one-on-one, -on -one, you'll see that there's gonna be long-term sustained use. We already have faculty using the system semester over semester. They're committed to it for the long term, which is good because when we started, we had no idea what we were doing and people were just freaking out because they were in the system for too long. But the fact that it's going to be sustainable, I think, is pretty clear now. And the tools are going to be more robust within the system. The backup archive element is going to be in place by the time Zach finishes his <laughs> clear doctorship. <laughs> uh, and I think that's yeah towards the end. That's it. So we, we saved six minutes for questions, or however long you can get. Yeah.